going to go ahead and call to order the Regional Transportation Commission meeting for Thursday, October 1st. And uh, we'll begin with the roll call. I'm sorry, I just need to make an announcement. Oh, go ahead. Our Junior Police Academy is happening, happening this week. And in about five minutes, they're going to let off a flashbang, which is a very loud explosion. We just wanted to let everyone know that everything is fine, and they're doing it as, a, as a, an example for the kids. So. We really appreciate that warning. Thank okay. you. <laughs> I'm just saying now we can do a roll call. Commissioner Rodkin. Commissioner Gonzalez. Commissioner Bator. Here. Commissioner Alternate Johnson. Here. Commissioner Leopold. Here. Commission Alternate Mulhern? Here. Commission Alternate Schifrin? Here. Commissioner Caput? Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez? Commissioner Randy Johnson? Here. Commissioner Brown? Here. Commissioner Bertrand? Here. And Commissioner Lowe? Here. Thank you. Uh, this is time for oral communications. This is people from the public can come up for three minutes and talk on any item that is related to uh, transportation is not on the agenda. Come on up. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Uh, Michael Sink with uh, Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. In the last few days, uh, I've been reading a uh, considerable amount of the uh, history of this uh, highway widening uh, stuff that's been trying to get done for 30 years. Uh, and I basically came to a couple of conclusions on that, uh, which we've already probably already had these conclusions, but it seems to be a battle between those who want to keep Santa Cruz a serene, beautiful, coastal town uh, versus those that want growth and the financial benefits that come from that. Um, primarily, I came up with the second thing, and I, I noticed that also Caltrans never lets projects die. Uh, measures, measures have been uh, failed twice, and they just continue to plan and plan and plan. Um, I just want people to realize if these highway widening projects become a reality, in this county, uh, you can't go back to the past as well as what the present is today. Uh, in, in the future, when these widening projects fail to provide congestion and relief, as which you promise, our options get limited. What will happen in the future when these things aren't working, maybe 10, 15 years down the road, you're going to have to once again try to widen and build out of the congestion problem. Um, I'll end it right there, basically. I do see that these books are being handed out to the commissioners. Uh, I brought those today. Uh, so instead of beating a dead horse with G greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled rhetoric, I'd like to give you these books. And basically, this was done at a presentation. And what it does, actually, it's a favor to you because it'll save you all from me coming up here as often and discussing greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled. If you have questions, these, this book answers the 50 misconceptions about uh, climate, uh, climate change and what people ask. And it answers them in a really uh, layman's terms. It's easy reading, uh, and it's an excellent book. Um, I hope you'll read it with an open mind and an open heart. Use it as a guide to help you make more informed decisions about projects that actually mitigate climate change and not enhance its detrimental effects on I want to thank you for giving me this time today. And also, I'd recommend once you do read it, uh, pass it along to others. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, Sally Arnold, representing Friends of the Rail and Trail. And we just wanted to uh, thank the commission, the RGC for submitting a letter in support of saving the seven phase two of the rail and trail that's going to the Coastal Commission this week. Um, we uh, uh, appreciate the support for the project. We uh, talked, you know, speaking of climate emissions, it's going to provide a climate free, you know, climate greenhouse gas emission free way for people to get to the beach area, and it's a really important project. So we just thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Rebecca Downing from the Seacliff Improvement Association. Here to remind you of our invitation to stroll to the Athos Village Green with us on Saturday morning, August 3rd. Some of you have RSVP'd, and we are looking forward to seeing you there. 
Our goal this weekend is to raise pedestrian awareness and support Aptos Village merchants, including those who donated some very generous prizes for us to share with participants. We're also grateful to New Leaf Market, who donated 100 reusable shopping bags for attendees. As I mentioned at my initial invitation to you, the pedestrian roadside paths into and out of Aptos Village are not well marked, sometimes narrow or dangerous, and in some sections non-existent. Many residents have told us that they walk the railroad tracks to the village because it's the safest way for them to do so. Our focus on Saturday are the streets leading in and out of the village. We realize that transportation funding for pedestrian safety measures here are on the horizon, but in the meantime, we want drivers to respect those of us who choose to be one less car on the road. We're hoping for 100 people to walk or ride a bicycle on Saturday, freeing up the space of 100 cars, which is approximately the length of, that local, of SoCal Drive to Aptos Village. At our welcome booth, we will be surveying participants about their pedestrian and cycling experience, which we will report to your commission and to the County Department of Public Works. While this information is not being collected to address a particular project, such as the corridor study or sustainable Santa Cruz, we hope that you will use it to make pedestrian funding decisions in the future. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Jennifer Lake from Ecology Action. And I'm here there it is. Yeah. I'm here to talk <laughs> to you about um, the proposed RFTP funding. And Ecology Action is concerned that our organization and other community groups will be cut out of funding opportunities to meet the needs of the community should the commission move ahead with the new proposed RFTP funding by formula for local jurisdictions only. We would request that the RTC consider another approach that includes community groups and other entities that rely on this funding source and delivery of valuable projects to meet the needs of the local community. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for our communications? Seeing none, we'll close that. Um, is there any addition to deletions to the uh, agenda? Yes, uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, we have replacement pages for items 9 and 19, and also a handout for item 17. Uh, and the legal closed session scheduled in of the meeting will not be necessary as well. Right. Yeah. All right, takes us to the consent agenda. These are items we normally deal with all in one vote. Is there any commissioner who wants to pull anything from the consent agenda? I don't want to pull anything, but I did want to thank staff for, upon related to item number seven, for uh, adding a letter having to do with uh, support for segment seven of the rail trail. I appreciate that that was um, done. And I also wanted to just uh, emphasize how much additional Measure D revenues the commission uh, has received this. more than what was uh, anticipated, about $1.8 million, which will then be distributed by formula. I think that's uh, going to be helpful to the various jurisdictions and the various projects. So uh, beyond that, I just make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Sorry. A motion and a second. Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak on any items on the consent agenda? Seeing none. Chair, will make a motion and a second. I make the motion. Schifrin and Bertrand with a second. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Okay, take this to uh, our regular agenda. Uh, any commissioners have anything to report on that they want to announce at this point? Okay. Oh, Mr. Johnson. Oh, thank you, Chair. Just uh, on behalf of the uh, citizens of Scotts Valley and also our city council, I um, want to welcome everybody to Scotts Valley. Um, I, uh, to the point that was just made on the pu uh, public hearing about APCOS, 
Uh, I know that place uh, pretty well, having lived there, and the constrictions of one lane or two lanes rather than four. And I'm happy to say that Scotts Valley Drive is one of those boulevards or drives that uh, is very wide, very accommodating, and uh, we feel very fortunate of uh, the help that the RTC many years ago gave to rebuild that drive, and the help that the RTC has done with respect to uh, ongoing uh, benefits to Mount Hermon, Scotts Valley Drive, and, and uh, I think all in all the transportation projects in, in our city are slow, uh, as in most places, but at the same time making headway. So again, just wanted to thank the RTC for that and also welcome uh, both the commissioners and the public to our city. Great, thanks for those comments. Any other commissioners? Commissioner Kaplan. I'll, I'll just mention that uh, this weekend will be the Strawberry Festival in uh, Watsonville, and it's a great event. Uh, and so anyway, I just want to get the information out if people want to go down to Watsonville for the uh, Strawberry Festival. It'll be Saturday and Sunday, and hope to see you there. Thank you. Great. Any other comments? Okay, uh, we'll move on to the director's report. Uh, good morning, Commissioners, uh, and unfortunately today you're going to be getting a Deputy Director's Report. Uh, so, um, and first I would like to inform you of something that I expect most of you already know. Your Executive Director not only talks the talk, but he walks the walk and bikes the bike. Uh, and um, unfortunately, this Sunday, as a result of riding his bike home, uh, he was uh, caused to have a serious fall um, on his bike. He suffered fractures to his left forearm requiring surgery. His surgery went well, and he's recovering. Uh, he is uh, currently at home now. He was discharged yesterday. He has been out this week, mostly in the hospital. Uh, but even with his injuries, your executive director continues to be engaged, ensuring that the work of the RTC proceeds accordingly. And so we, you know, we appreciate what, uh, what he continues to do even while he is injured. Uh, now, the Monterey Bay Santa Cruz Scenic Trail Network, as you are aware, the city of Santa Cruz has been moving forward on the implementation of uh, segments of the trail within the city of Santa Cruz. Permits and approvals for phase two of segment seven were, were appealed to the Santa Cruz City Council. Uh, the appeals were denied by the, uh, by the city council at the June 11th meeting. As a result, a lawsuit uh, was filed against the city of Santa Cruz and the RC has been named real party in interest. RTC staff will work with uh, legal counsel to ensure a proper response from the RTC. In addition, as uh, noted uh, on your uh, consent agenda, there's a letter uh, requesting that an appeal to the Coastal Commission uh, not, not be granted. Uh, the Coastal Commission will be considering that appeal at their August 9th meeting in Eureka, and the letter that you just approved on the consent agenda will be sent to them right away so that they have that for their consideration. Um, on the Highway 9 San Lorenzo Valley of Compete Streets Corridor Plan, RTC staff met with Caltrans and Santa Cruz County Public Works in July to discuss implementation of the Highway 9 Compete Streets Corridor Plan. Since the last RTC meeting, County Public Works has uh, done uh, some work uh, that's very helpful. They've installed directional signage at the edge of the Highway 9 right away encouraging pedestrians to use alternate routes on Fog Creek Road, Clearview Place, and Cooper Street instead of walking on the shoulder of Highway 9 between schools and Randall Road. Um, and then the crosswalk on Felton Empire Road connection uh, 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 connecting Gushy Street and Cooper Street was also improved with striping and signage to increase, increase the visibility of pedestrians using this uh, alternate route. Now Caltrans is also uh, uh, drafted a cooperative agreement with the RTC uh, to provide some measure of funding to Caltrans for development of a project initi initiation document to complete uh, uh, to provide some of the upcoming uh, potential improvements uh, on Highway 9. And uh, our Caltrans representative can say more about, about that during the Caltrans report. Uh, and I think some of you may know that uh, uh, Supervisor McPherson's office is also working um, uh, with uh, school, the school district, RTC, Caltrans, and the county uh, to uh, schedule a community meeting in late August uh, around this uh, uh, project and the improvements that are needed. Um, 
Now, on community outreach and engagement that the uh, the RTC does, I, mean, I think you, you all know that uh, that continues to be a priority for the RTC. And one of the ways that your staff works to engage with the community is by attending community events to talk about RTC programs and projects and get valuable feedback from the community. On July 18th, your staff had a table at the Watsonville Informational Fair hosted by Commissioner Aurelio Gonzalez, uh, Council District 2, uh, where RTC staff engaged with community members about things like the Cruise 501 program, bicycle safety, and the Coastal Rail Trail. The RTC will also have a booth at the upcoming City of Santa Cruz Street Smarts Family Bike Ride event on August 24th from 10 to 12, 10, 10 a.m. to 12 uh, p.m. at the Tannery along with the, uh, with the bike ride with Santa Cruz Mayor Martin Watkins, various agencies and community groups will have interactive booths to promote bicycle and pedestrian safety to kids and families. Now, part of what RTC staff does at community engagement events is to inform committees, uh, of, to inform members of the community about participating with the RTC through membership in RTC committees. And currently, there are a number of vacancies in the Elderly and Disabled Transportation Advisory Committee. So staff is working to fill those vacancies. And any suggestions or recommendations you may have would be useful. Uh, uh, last, I'd just like to let you know uh, something on the Federal Transportation Funding uh, Reauthorization. Uh, so the current Federal Transportation Funding Law is the Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, or FAST Act. It was enacted in 2015, and it is due to expire in September 2020. Now, on Tuesday, the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works approved America's Transportation Infrastructure Act, a bill that would reauthorize federal transportation policy and funding once the FAST Act expires. RTC staff and the RTC's federal assist, uh, assistant, Capital Edge, are reviewing the bill and working with a statewide coalition to provide input on the bill based on RTC's approved priorities. So that concludes the report. Any comments from the commissioner? Any questions on the report, Mr. Shipman? I, I would like to ask the commission to agree to send a get well card to our executive director and wish him a very speedy recovery. I don't know if a motion would be in so many, so let's do it. I have a motion and a second. Any other conversation on that? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries unanimously. We'll take care of that. Thank you. Any other comments? I just want to make a comment. I think this will follow up on this in her report, but I think uh, we all remember we had an emotional testimony at the last meeting uh, with uh, the Highway 9 improvements, and I think the fact that, that anything has been done in such a quick way is appreciated by that community. So, with that, um, we have a public hearing at 9.30, but I think we have time to get in the uh, uh, Caltrans report, Ms. Lowe, so uh, we're going to jump ahead to you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. I would like to let you know that we have an interim director in, San, in Sacramento right now, uh, Bob Franzoya, has been a senior advisor at the California State Transportation Agency, and he is now the interim director until a permanent director is named. This is, of course, in the departure of uh, Lori Berman, our most recent director. Uh, following up on the Highway 9 activities, our engineering team and uh, our interdisciplinary team, rather, uh, is looking um, at all of the um, potential for improvements along the Highway 9 corridor. We look forward to getting the cooperative agreement together, as um, your deputy director mentioned. Uh, the cooperative agreement is an arrangement between Caltrans and the RTC for, um, for conducting work that will correspond to the limits of the Complete Streets Corridor Plan. We do have, Caltrans has four projects now in the corridor where his project um, initiation documents are getting underway. Two of them are safety projects, and two of them are um, pavement preservation projects. So our hope is that in the, um, in the evaluation of complete streets opportunities for the whole corridor, we will uh, do a couple of things. One is we will inform Caltrans' own shop projects, those four I just mentioned, to, to see what, um, what type of improvements may be incorporated into those projects. And then we will identify other projects that the RTC or the county uh, may wish to proceed um, as separate standalone projects. Of course, the uh, location around the high school is of uh, particular interest and focus. Uh, the teams are working hard to identify both short-term 
and the model of solutions that can be implemented. Uh, of course, we're looking to implement something um, as quickly as we can on the one hand, and then work um, toward a longer term solution that, as you know, as you mentioned, um, transportation projects take time. So anything that um, would involve a widening or, um, you know, say, retaining walls and things like that, that will take a little extra time. Um, meanwhile, though, I think we're hopeful that we'll come up with uh, good solutions together. And um, otherwise, I have uh, the other information in the Caltrans report is current for you. Uh, I know that we've, uh, our office heard from Supervisor Caput's office with a special interest in the uh, ADA project on 152. Uh, that project um, is included in your um, in your report. Uh, in the back, I believe it's uh, project number uh, 20 on your list. Uh, it says construct ADA pathway, and that will be a bridge, a small pedestrian bridge that will parallel 152 in that location. It's on schedule to reach construction in 2022. Any other questions? Uh, we'll start with Mr. Caput. Go ahead. Uh, I want to thank you and your staff for uh, uh, being re very responsive and also, uh, uh, you know, giving information and everything. I, I'm just curious, uh, just a general uh, view on the federal highway money that looks like it's going to be withheld from uh, California and all the counties. Uh, does that affect Caltrans quite a bit? Because uh, it involves uh, matching funds and trying to get projects done with uh, federal money and then you have state money and of course county money. Uh, Supervisor Caput, I'm, I'm afraid I'm not aware of the threat of withholding funds. Okay, uh, the, the federal uh, highway uh, money, uh, we're talking about uh, millions of dollars uh, that normally go to Well, uh, well, I think he's talking about the county of Santa Cruz is facing a $35 million uh, threat. We've already lost $6 million because they're being rigid on the timelines. Okay, you're speaking uh, of the emergency relief. Yes. yes. Okay, so our director uh, uh, attended a meeting in Sacramento with uh, the uh, division, administrator, division administrator of FHWA back in May, I believe, May or June. Uh, and they had a very productive conversation about the needs to, to um, provide for what could be extensions on certain projects that meet certain criteria. So, um, so there is a path. There is not a blanket of withholding of money from the states, but the federal um, emergency relief program has um, has specific criteria to be met for timelines. So I, I know that our our district director was working hard to ensure that um, funding that could come to Camp Santa Cruz would still come to Santa Cruz. And then I, I think the uh, chairman of the uh, uh, Board of Supervisors is going to Washington, D.C.? Yes, that's uh, true. And he's going to be meeting with uh, a representative from Federal Highways to make the county's case. Um, the irony of the the denial seems to be that uh, the county didn't meet the timelines mostly because of delays caused by federal agencies. So um, he's hoping that by making that very clear, it will be possible to get relief. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. That was important. Uh, Commissioner Johnson. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Lowe, and all your colleagues and the RTC staff for all the work you've done to come up with uh, short, medium, and long-term potential priorities for Highway 9. I know that Commissioner McPherson really appreciates it. Um, we all appreciate it. Um, you know, it's so important that we make, we, that, that the public sees some tangible progress, but also be educated about what it takes to do projects. Um, the signage has been really helpful just because it was tangible, it was helpful. Thank you for Captain Caltrans for um, allowing the county to install alternative route signs so we can direct the, the kids that go to that campus to, um, to, to paths other than Highway 9 to, 
bike and walk. That's been really helpful. Let's just hope they do it. That's, and we seek the path of least resistance, so we still might go along Highway 9. But all, all the progress you've made has been remarkable. I agree with the chair, and I appreciate it. And I know that Mr. McPherson does as well. Thank you. Great. Any other comments? I have a question on um, project number 11 on 18-3, which is the Highway 117 ramp safety improvements. Uh, it says can a construction timeline is spring 2020. Is that when it, the project's going to be completed? Or is that? That would be the construction season. So that, would, be, that would be when construction would start. And will it be completed that season? I will have to look to see what the end date is. I don't know what how many construction days would be in the contract. I don't, I'm not sure. So the construction is going to start in the spring? Because there seems to be some work going on now around there. So, okay. Well, would you get that to us? Yes, please? certainly. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Bell? Okay, thank you for that presentation. Uh, we'll move back to uh, item 17. This is our public hearing. This is a uh, draft 2019 public participation plan. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioners Shannon Munns, uh, Communication Specialist on your staff. So every four years, a public participation plan is required to be updated and approved by metropolitan planning organizations and regional transportation planning agencies. With this in mind, a draft 2019 public participation plan was prepared by the Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments in collaboration with the RTC, uh, the Council of San Benito County Governments, and the Transportation Agency for Monterey County. The draft plan complies with applicable federal and state legislation, including the current Fixed America's Surface Transportation Act, which was enacted in 2015. Additionally, under the California Transportation Commission 2017 Regional Transportation Plan Guidelines, a documented public involvement process should be prepared prior to each RTPA's development of its Regional Transportation Plan. So the purpose of this draft plan is, or the plan is to establish a process for the public to be able to participate in transportation planning, programming, and project implementation, including the development of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Plan, as well as the Metropolitan Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy for the AMBA region. The draft 2019 public participation plan incorporates strategies to ensure that, to the greatest extent possible, uh, Interagency consultation and public participation are an integral part of the regional transportation planning and decision-making process. So once this plan is adopted by the RTC, it will meet all of the federal and state requirements, and it will be the official public participation plan for this agency through 2023. We're currently in a required 45-day comment period to solicit input on the draft plan, and are here today to receive input from you all and members of the public. Um, during today's scheduled public hearing. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you have on the plan or take any input. Any questions? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I sent you a list of uh, stakeholders, uh, so I won't go into that. Okay. There are just two areas in the actual plan. Um, uh, the one is a relatively minor change. Uh, it's about the Metro and the, met, uh, the, uh, the MAC committee that we have, the, uh, uh, the, the riders. Uh, it used to be appointed, each, each board member appointed one, and we changed that to it's appointed by the board. I'm pretty sure we made that change. So it's, that's just a okay. language change. And uh, that's this, in the Metro section? That's in the Metro okay. section. Um, uh, I can tell you exactly, on page 21. Okay. About the advisory, transit citizen advisory right. committee. Uh, the other question I had was about language assistance strategies, um, and it has provide outreach material, larger fonts, and in Braille at public outreach meetings. Yes. Did we do that? To my knowledge, we have not done that yet or since I've been here. Um, I, I can look into it further and see if it's something we do if we get a request or if we can yeah. start doing that. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not necessarily advocating for yeah. it. I'm just saying it's in the plan right. as if we're going to do that. So if it, that's a change in practice, we would have yeah. to prepare for that. Definitely. I'll it, look it, at that and see how we can. Yeah. Yeah. If I may add uh, to that. Uh, yeah, the, the idea is that um, we, we, what we do have on the agendas for commission meetings and the meetings and so on, that if anybody needs 
uh, special uh, or particular accommodations to participate in meetings uh, to let us know and we'll provide those. So something like that, yeah, we don't provide that on a regular basis, but if it's if it's requested, then we would. So. All right, I thought it was a, a very good plan, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the seven guiding principles. Yes. Or I thought it was, was something we should remember all the time. Absolutely. About, uh, about okay. the public outreach. Yeah. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner yeah. Cochran, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, coming from Watsonville, uh, the stakeholder groups are really an emphasis because the workshops are not effective uh, in terms of participation. And I really want to make sure that uh, you know, we sort of culturally embed what we've got for our community to get that word out for Watsonville and, and making sure it's multilingual because we want to make sure that we're getting that voice heard uh, and having you know six people show up and uh, or, or even more than that, but most of them not even from our community telling our community what we need. Uh, we really need to go past that. So the emphasis probably will be more in the stakeholder groups and where you can actually get a, a good segment of the population together um, to meet um, and then have presentations in, in those venues. I think that would be more helpful than uh, using the community room and not getting enough people there. So I'm really hoping that we're a bit more creative on that. And I, I know that there's, uh, uh, there is somewhat of a barrier for Watsonville on those that, that just don't want to show up, yeah. especially when they're dealing with traffic to get somewhere at six o'clock. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that we're having some flexibility to make sure that those stakeholder groups um, are weighted heavier, heavier than a community room for at six o'clock at night. Yeah, I agree. Um, in the Watsonville community, we try to think of different ways because we know we can't always reach people at those meetings and they're not always effective. Um, and I would love to maybe reach out to the Watsonville commissioners with the list of stakeholders we have and see if there are others that you think and maybe kind of brainstorm some better ways to get into that community because that is a real priority for us. Thank you. Great. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you. So this is a plan we do every four years, so obviously there was a prior plan. Correct. How does this plan differentiate, I have a couple questions about it, how does this plan differentiate from the prior plan um, and or are there any lessons we've learned from public input around our outreach in the, in the mm -hmm. last few years that has improved the plan that's before us right now. Yeah, so, so we, have, we updated this plan based on, you know, we added new ways, the ways we're um, engaging with the community is kind of always evolving. Um, we added a lot of different ways that we're engaging with people. Um, I have only been here for a little over a year, so I haven't been, I wasn't involved in the last plan. Um, so I don't know all of the practices that have improved since then, but we're continually looking at everything in different ways that we can engage in the community. Um, I, I believe Heather from AMBAG is here, and she may be able to add to that, since um, AMBAG is the lead agency on this plan, and she's been involved last, the last time and this time, so she might be able to talk a little bit to that more. Yes. Thank you, Heather Adamson, planning director at AMBAG. Um, yes, so we do do this every uh, four years. Uh, the last one was approved in 2015, and if you uh, remember from an earlier comment, uh, the FAST Act was also approved in 2015. Uh, so we this plan better incorporates the requirements of that. Um, we did beef up, um, as Commissioner Leopold mentioned, the seven guiding principles, um, and we did a lot of work before we released the draft plan, getting input from all the TAC members, in all three counties, your ITAC, um, we went to uh, the senior elderly, senior disabled advisory committee in all three counties, um, and we did a lot of coordination ahead of time to make sure that we had updated stakeholders lists and looked at what other regions had done in the last four years. Um, I can to uh, Commissioner uh, Kaufman Gomez's comment about the public workshops. Unfortunately, that still is a requirement, our federal and state requirement to hold those workshops but we are really trying to gear up how else we get the word out um, to not just our stakeholders at the technical level like ITAC, but also to um, um, stakeholder groups and trying to get on their agendas and make presentations and get input at regularly scheduled meetings in the community rather than just focusing on workshops because as we know, we often don't get the wide spectrum of folks that we really want input to. So those are some of the ways that we've tailored uh, changes to this time. Of course, we can always improve, and um, each of the three RTPAs are holding public hearings. Yours is today. We'll be holding one at AMBAG in a couple weeks, and then uh, making all, incorporating all the changes, additions, and comments 
uh, following that, and then approval in, uh, I believe, your approval in September, ours in early October. Thank you. Thanks for the insight, Heather. Commissioner Bertrand. Heather, maybe the answers. So I noticed the uh, plan's going to be on the AMBAC website. Um, what, what else is being planned to let the general public know about this particular way to participate? Um, we've sent out uh, email blasts to our stakeholder list, which if you've uh, looked at one of the appendices, which includes all the stakeholders, we have emails for all those stakeholders. Uh, so uh, when the plan was released at our June meeting, uh, similar to your June meeting, um, we sent out an email blast saying the plan's available, take a look at it, it's on our website. Um, any comments or questions, we've been going to committees um, as they come up over uh, the next few months. Uh, we expanded the public comment period from a minimum, it's minimum 45 days, but we actually had closer to like a 90, 85 day common period because it was over the summer. So we wanted to make sure we were getting uh, folks input. Um, and we've just been talking it up as much as possible whenever we go. Um, I think one of the key, and I think uh, the two commissioners early comments really nailed it, is to make sure that we have the stakeholder, the best stakeholder list that we can, that isn't just our regular folks that we reach out to, um, because that kind of tailors what we're going to do over the next three or four years as you develop your RTP, we develop that MTP SCS as well as other efforts and making sure we get all the parties involved. So we're always continually expanding our stakeholder list as we move forward and working with our partners to get the word out. I think the stakeholder list is probably the most effective. Um, are the stakeholders um, responding in kind, putting something on their website that indicates how they're going to be um, including participation and making that available to the public, to their, their members? That I'm not sure of. I'd have to go back and follow up with some of them, some of the key ones. A lot of them are very small stakeholder groups, right. um, so they may not have a specific website related to their group, but uh, some of the larger ones I can go back and, and check. And, you know, obviously it's we still have a, almost a month comments uh, period closes at the end of August, so um, if not, I can encourage them to put them put it up on their website as well, yeah, or at I least mean, links to, to RTCs or AMBEX website. Right, because it would increase the effectiveness of your work already. Yes. Thank you. I'll do that too. For the Santa Cruz, state, Santa Cruz County stakeholders that we sent it to, we have seen several of them send it out through their newsletters and promote it on their social media sites, asking their members to comment and things like that. So we have seen that happen for Santa Cruz specifically. Any other questions for the commissioners? Commissioner Rocker. Uh, we, we had an uh, add on the packet today, a letter from Linda Wilson, uh, our former executive director, who um, says she, she's not aware of the current practice, so she's not complaining, but she wants to make sure that the uh, packets, as, the, the meeting packets as they appear online, are fully accessible to the public and allow them to correspond with page numbers and so forth so they can make appropriate comments. And um, I don't know what to do here except to ask our staff. Um, I'm a dinosaur. I read myself in hard copy. I don't know what's going on online about it. Um, so to, uh, basically, I'd just like to refer this to our staff and make sure that we do that, because it seems like all of our requests seem pretty reasonable, that there be a certain typeface not smaller than 12 point and those kinds of things. Of course, some charts have to be smaller than 12 point, but the text be 12 point. And, um, a number of other points, so I, I hope our, our staff will uh, respond to our concerns and make sure that our packets do go out in that way and we can access the yeah, Yes, I did respond to her, and Louisa and I spoke about it yesterday. Um, a lot of the things she asked are things that we could probably implement fairly easily, and the ones that we can't, we'll look into ways that we can do that, but we are going to look into implementing some of the things that she brought up. Thank you, that's yes. it. Any other questions? Okay, thank you for the presentation. And with that, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and open up, excuse me, open a public hearing and uh, have comments from the public if you'd like to give us on uh, the participation plan. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sally Arnold, still with Friends of the Rail Trail. Um, so uh, thanks for, for organizing this, and um, of course, you know, we're being on public participation, so we're interested. Um, I wanted to just carry on to what Mr. Walken was saying about the, uh, when I was looking at the packet last night, I was trying to see, oh, is support on the public, uh, in, on the stakeholders list, which I was pleased to see it was. I had to hold my, uh, 
my laptop like this, and then try to kind of figure out how to scroll like this so I can see it, because it was, anyway, just that's an example of how finding information is difficult sometimes. Um, so yeah, I think those, those suggestions I saw in the letter um, were like, yeah, that would really help. Um, the, um, and when I found our, uh, Friends of the Rail and Trail on the table of the list, I noticed that we were listed as a bicycle and pedestrian interest group. And since you are well aware that we are uh, looking at a much broader uh, view of uh, transportation in the county than just bikes and peds, though we're all for that. Um, We'd like to be renamed as a transportation interest group, if possible, and it would be helpful, I think, to spell out our name as Friends of the Rail and Trail, because unless you already know us as for you, you know, that would not have any meaning to you if you were looking at that list. Um, and the last thing um, I would like to mention is, you know, I, I, I was recently appointed as an alternate to the Bicycle Advisory Committee, which I really am pleased with and enjoying. Um, and I was noticing how you know there are some people who are reporting hazards um, uh, that there's a there's a hotline or something to report hazards and how to you know when there's problems, but it's not well known. Um, and that would be a, certainly a way to engage the public because the public is constantly like, hey, there's you know this sidewalk is making me trip or there's no way to get my bike over here. I mean we know those of us who are out in the community notice those things all the time, but we have no idea how to report that. And there apparently is a way to report it, but it's not well known. And so that would be a way to increase engagement. Because um, everybody likes to complain, and then once you have their email, you know, um, you can reach out to them. <laughs> so uh, anyway, thank you for, for working on this. Thank you. Uh, once again, Michael Saint with CFST. Um, just some uh, suggestions. Uh, page 28 under involvement um, just briefly states that uh, broad base involvement by members of the community would be sought after, also by reaching out to community groups to get a variety of perspectives to enhance the project. A good way to do this, in my opinion, which I've worked with uh, for the last year and a half with uh, a Citizens Advisory Council at Monterey Bay Community Power. Um, I think the RTC should look into this. It's made up of uh, community groups and with a diversified group of citizens. Uh, no elected officials or staff members. I'm not saying that that's a, a bad thing, but it, it would work with them in conjunction. And as an example here, there would be a representative sitting right here listening to this meeting, and then they could go into their diversified groups and explain what went on. And then many questions come up with that way. It's been my experience attending these meetings that to interact with your peers and fe fellow citizens has a better way of getting more information out, and you're not as much intimidated by the elected officials at these meetings. Um, page 34, number two, community outreach events and strategies. Uh, I would like to add electric vehicle shows to that. Uh, we do that on a regular basis in all of the cities around the Santa Cruz area. And presently on September 14th, if you want to get some exposure, a large exposure, uh, from 12 to 5, we have the National Drive Electric Day on Cooper and Pacific. We've been given another street for this. Um, we're also offering sponsorships and a, a booth or either, you know, tabling at that event. And we'd also like to get an elected official to help kick that off on September 14th. So that's something I think that Ecology Action might reach out to you soon, see if we can get someone there for the public. Um, also page 36, which is marketing and visualization strategies. Um, I didn't see anything in there, I could have missed it. It's, it, it's a long stuff that we had to read last night. Um, I'm not sure if you have door to door soliciting on that. And you know, that goes back to the old school, I'm a little bit like Mike and with Dinosaur also. And that's pretty much how a lot of our advocacy stuff gets done. Um, and then also driving a county car to the up and down the neighborhoods, going door to door, even if you had a car that said, you know, uh, Santa Cruz uh, Transportation Commission or something to that effect, neighbors would see that and talk to one another. Why was that car there? And then you could go on and explain that they came to it. So I think that would uh, lend to a lot of uh, good citizen output. Thank you for your time. Thank you.
other comments on topic? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and close the uh, public uh, hearing and bring it back for any uh, other comments by commissioners. Any other comments? Okay, we're going to go ahead and we'll move to approve. We'll be approved that plan. Okay, second. No, we're, just, we're, we're just taking it. We're just taking it, but it doesn't need a motion or anything. This will come back in October for your approval. Right, so yes. just taking it. So thank, yes. say thank you for that presentation. It's very thorough. And we'll have this back in how many days? Uh, the October meeting. October meeting. Okay, great. Thank you for that. All right, we're going to move on to uh, item 19. This is the alternative analysis uh, transit right away. Uh, Ginger, welcome. Good morning, Commissioners. I'm Ginger Dicar, Senior Transportation Planner on your staff. My item today is to discuss the scope of work for the alternatives analysis of high capacity public transit on the rail right away. As a reminder, the Unified Corridor Investment Study was completed in January 2019. The outcome of the Unified Corridor Study for the rail right-of-way was to protect the rail right-of-way for a high-capacity public transit service next to a bicycle and pedestrian trail and continue to consider passenger rail service on the rail right-of-way consistent with Proposition 116 requirements. Also, to work jointly with Metro to develop a scope of work for additional analysis of high-capacity public transit alternatives on the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line, including their costs, operations, and funding plans, and a plan to protect Metro's funding sources. RTC staff has been working closely with Metro staff to develop this scope of work for consultant services to perform the alternatives analysis and develop a business plan for high capacity public transit on the rail right of way. A draft scope was brought to the RTC at the June 27 RTC meeting. A motion was passed by this commission to revise the alternatives analysis scope of work to incorporate input received at the June 27 meeting, including adding the requirement that the consultants utilize a triple bottom line sustainability framework in terms of equity, environment, and economy in developing the performance measures for this analysis. The scope has been revised to include this triple bottom line sustainability as the framework for developing the performance measures. The performance measures included in the scope are reorganized in terms of environment, economy, and equity, as can be seen on page 19-9 of the packet. And I want to make sure it is clear that the final performance measures that will be evaluated in this study will be developed and brought back to the Commission for approval as part of this project. Input on the performance measures will be sought from members of the public, partner agencies, RTC advisory committees, the RTC and Metro. Uh, and um, input was also received at the June 27th meeting expressing concern on how input will be solicited for underrepresented communities. There is a task for consultants to develop a public and stakeholder outreach plan for this project, which includes direct solicitation to transportation disadvantaged communities and hard to reach groups. The input from the Metro Board was also received on June 28th. It was consistent with the input from the June 27th RTC meeting. So the proposed timeline for the alternatives analysis um, is the, on August 5th, that's Monday of next week, to release the request for proposals for the alternatives analysis. I have in the staff report September 2nd deadline to submit proposals, but I uh, was reminded that that is a holiday, so that would be moved to September 3rd, the deadline to submit proposals. And um, October 3rd, 2019, is the RTC meeting. At this point, we would come back and provide recommendation to the Commission on a consultant contract, and at that time, the final scope of work that will be part of the contract will be provided to the Commission for approval. And we're also, we're still striving to have the, um, on J January 2021, the um, Alternatives Analysis Report finalized. With that, the RTC staff recommends that the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission review and provide input on the draft scope of work for the Alternatives <coughs> Analysis, as shown in Attachment A, to be released in their request for proposals for consultant services. With that, I'll take questions and comments. Okay, we need to review and provide input and questions. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I want to thank the staff for uh, taking a look at this and including all the pieces um, in this uh, RFP. Um, it was suggested in a letter, which I thought was a good idea, 
um, that when it comes to task 7.5 about the alternative analysis results, uh, the RTC and Metro do a joint meeting. Um, probably better for staff, but it would, I think since there's so many members of the Metro board here uh, as well, um, it, would be a, it would be a great opportunity for the two organizations to work together um, and hear and take that testimony. Uh, that obviously isn't something that needs to be worked out for the RFP, but I just want to share that in the hopes that we can plan that whenever the, the, I, don't, I don't have an idea what the timeline is, that's somewhere down the road, but it might be worthwhile to reach out to Metro now and, and uh, try to see if we can find a date that works together uh, to do that instead of doing two separate pieces. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I wanted to uh, also thank staff for responsiveness to the comments that were made at the previous meeting in terms of the changes to the RFP. I want to make another suggestion um, following up on the, the last one from Commissioner Leopold, and that has to do with uh, the my sense of the importance of this process in terms of the commission and the transit district working together on this uh, analysis. And given its importance, I think it, it would be worth considering, and I'd like to propose, that the commission set up a, a, a task force to work with the staff and the uh, uh, consultants throughout this process, uh, with the task force being made up of members of the commission and members of the transit district. There's a long-standing, there are long-standing issues, I think, around the use of the rail corridor that have been problematic, in my view, between the commission and the transit district, at least at the staff level, in terms of the use of that uh, corridor. I think the, the carrying out the alternatives analysis is a, an important step forward in terms of having the two agencies work together. I think it would be worthwhile in terms of the outcome of the analysis to have, uh, rather than just a joint meeting, which from my perspective is always hard to get, uh, to get things done at, uh, just a, a task force that could report back to both bodies, um, assuring that the process is moving forward smoothly and that cooperation between uh, the various components of, is really working. So I would like to suggest that for the commission's consideration, if the commission agrees for the consideration by the previous district. Before I go to Mr. Bertrand, I think that's a great idea. And I think because of this logistics that are happening right now, uh, as I'm chairing both of those committees, I think uh, I'll take that under advisement and maybe we'll do an app. We'll, what I'll suggest, and I'll talk with uh, uh, Mr. Clifford and Mr. Preston, is we can create an ad hoc committee for both of those and um, at that point, once we get that out, we'll put it out that we're seeking members who would like to participate in those committees. And I agree with your point that to get a small group of people, possibly three from each, uh, to have that committee would, would <coughs> save a lot of time and we could get some good direction. So thank you for that comment. Thank you. Commissioner Bertrand. Um, thank you very much. Um, I agree with um, Representative Schiffrin's uh, recommendation and your support, that, and I totally would like to be part of that committee. Um, I'm sorry I missed the last meeting, so I'm on vacation with my daughter, but I'm particularly encouraged by the fact that we're going to end up with a business plan to move forward. And the idea that we'll have a performance-based approach, including the triple bottom line. So basically, we need to look at what's going to give us the benefit for the amount of money this community is going to pay to make sure that this comes about. So having a performance-based planning effort, I'd be totally for, and the bottom line is, is the community going to benefit, and are we going to be willing to pay for it? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Moore. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, just, uh, is $650,000 sufficient to complete this project? That's what we have budgeted uh, right now for the project. Will it be sufficient? I couldn't tell you right now. It'll, it'll depend on um, um, you know, as, as you go through the process of, pro of procuring a consultant uh, and working through that, there might be modifications to the scope uh, that we'll, you know, we'll bring to you for, for approval and so that, you know, that, and then we'll, we'll get um, cost estimates from the consultants based on the scope uh, so they, you know, 
we might get cost estimates that are higher than what we have budgeted. So then we'll have to consider, the commissioner have to consider, you know, how to uh, produce, you know, proceed uh, with the work. So at this point, we don't know if that's exactly what it will cost. And, and uh, the, the, this is, I mean, the, looking at the, at the deliverables for the RFPs, there's a lot of work that's going to go into this. Um, and the, the, the actual work will be done over a series of holidays. Is it a reasonable time frame to expect this to be completed um, October to January? You think? I mean, based on your experience on these sorts of, of working with consulting groups, do they have the necessary? I mean, there, there are engineering facets to this, public policy, um, analysis that they're going to have to do, budgetary analysis that's going to have to happen. I mean, I'm sure that, that the, the applicants will have the, the necessary resources available to them to complete the project, but it, is this enough time for them to do this? It's probably what, it's a year plus. Oh, a year, I'm so sorry. Okay, 20, <laughs> never mind. A year should be absolutely sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> Clarification is always good. Thank you so much. Um, and if I, if I might um, add uh, one, uh, wrinkle to the deliverables. Um, under the um, under task five, where we're developing and, anal and, and evaluating the initial uh, alter alternatives, um, could, the, could we ask the consultant to, to list the specific sources of funding that they're looking at for each of the alternatives and the amount of funding that they're assuming will be allocated to, the, to that particular project? Um, because there, there are a lot of overlapping funding sources, um, and obviously not, if we're, not all of the projects are going to qualify for all the funding sources. Um, so in, in UCIS, for example, we got um, just a laundry list of all the various um, uh, funding programs that were looked at, um, but they, they, they didn't identify which projects specifically they were going to or the amounts. So if they could just, just like show their work. So. Um, uh, there, so task four is to assess transit funding through uh, 2045. So they're going to be doing the work assessing all the funding sources. I just want them to show the work. This funding source is going to have this much money allocated to this alternative and do it by alternative. Yes, we can do that. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It, it seems to me that there would be, well, you might have overlapping sources. The one pot of money might be able to fund rail option or bus option or something like that. So you would you, you would be looking at a pot, let's say cap and trade funds um, uh, of a particular amount uh, and it would be an estimate and then you, they, they could fall into two categories is what I'm saying. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Commissioner Brown. Um, yeah, so I also want to thank the staff for coming back to us with this more fleshed out um, proposal related to the triple bottom line. I think we got a lot of feedback from the community and hopefully this has um, addressed those concerns. Um, so in terms of task 2.4, I just wanted to highlight that because I think um, just following up on the conversation we had related to the public outreach plan, um, item 17, uh, the significance of uh, stakeholder outreach is, is very clear. Um, I think the significance of, of trying to find non-traditional ways of ensuring public participation is very important. So thank you to Commissioner Kaufman Gomez for bringing that up to the last item. Um, it says here, RTC and Metro staff will develop a stakeholder list with assistance from the consultant that includes you know, the list of groups, which is great. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any way that uh, to clarify how members of the public and or members of the commission might uh, make suggestions about who should ultimately be on that stakeholder list. It sounds like Commissioner Leopold just emailed directly to staff. It, it just would be nice to be clear that we would like to have um, as cast as wide a net as possible in making those decisions. Uh, maybe this is a point to remind the Commission that this is just the scope of work to be released for the request for proposals. Obviously, every step along the way in this project, we're going to be coming back to the Commission to seek input or approval on every single step. So this public participation, this public and, and stakeholder outreach plan will be brought to you for input, um, approval, whichever way you want the process to go, but that is the understanding for staff right now and the project team to come back to you at every step of the way to um, 
identify the details of what we're going to be working on with this yes. study. Yes, and thank you, and I appreciate that. I'm just thinking in terms of um, ensuring that the consultants are kind of aware in terms of upfront for them in the their proposals available, but at the same time, you know, like we can bring it up again, and yeah, we will. Thank you. I think it's important we have a broad representation, so thank you for those points. Commissioner for Trent. Oh, no, she's first. Oh, sorry. Oh, thank you. So I, thank you. So um, I am really supportive of the notion of having a task force. I think that's a really good idea. Um, and the first thing that popped in my mind when you suggested it, Commissioner Schifrin, is that it should be a Brown Act, not an ad hoc. But then as we're discussing this and as you're discussing the task 2.4, and the need, and, and you said, uh, Ginger, that every single step of this process, you'd be coming back to this commission for input and so forth. Um, I'm not sure that you need to make the ad hoc or the task force um, around that committee, as long as there is, there, there's a lot of nuts and bolts sort of interfacing with the consultant and with staff that need to happen, and the sausage making of all that, it makes a lot of sense that it could be an ad hoc committee, as long as every step comes back to the commission for input. Um, so I'm, um, I'm going to stick with, I think it's a great idea, and it should be ad hoc, and both Metro and this commission should be represented on it. Um, but I do want to say that one of the, um, the, the biggest pieces of input that I have witnessed over the years is people feeling, or community groups feeling like they haven't had enough time to review what are really complex um, lists of criteria, for example, or to your point, every step of this process will come back here and to Metro to say, here's where we're at and here's what we've been working on and so forth. Uh, as much time as possible to publish um, measurement, performance measures, for example, would be the perfect example so that members of the community who are interested in having input, they can, have, they can digest it, they can discuss it with their groups, they can come back and tell this commission and the Metro board their thoughts. Um, I know that the minimum requirement is 72 hours for the Brown Act, but Often these things require more time. So I would just encourage as much time as possible that's feasible for that kind of very important threshold framing performance measures um, be given extra time. Thank you for that. I'm going to go ahead and clarify, Mr. Schiffer. I'm, I'm assuming that you were intending for an ad hoc committee because that was what I was you know, yes. consistent with. Thank you. I'm glad we clarified that. I think the ad hoc allows that committee to work more efficiently and not have the restrictions. And actually, everything will be presented back to this body at, at those bodies. And so uh, I'm, I'm glad we clarified that. Thank you for that. Commissioner Bertrand. Yeah. Um, you just took a lot of words out of my Sorry. mouth. But that's fine. Um, I think the commission here um, is very thankful to staff uh, preparing this. And you know, you put a, a real undergrounding principle here that we need to reach out to the public and provide ways for them to participate and I appreciate that and the other aspect that I appreciate is repeated um, updates to the Commission here so that we are kept abreast of the rest of the process so that um, as things unfold we could more readily participate and direct things as we see fit so thank you very much to staff I appreciate it thank you Commissioner Cotton Millings thank you um, there's a couple comments. One is, can you talk a little bit more about the business plan and the, and the components that you're looking to get from a consultant on that? Um, sure. Yeah, that came about um, as part of the uh, Proposition 116 funds that um, allowed us to purchase the rail line. The California Transportation Commission has been interested in RTC developing a business plan for um, how we utilize the rail right of way. So obviously if we go rail or if we go bus rapid transit or some other um, high capacity public transit option, it would be a business plan in order to actually think about the steps that would be taken, um, the funding sources that would allow um, to move forward with, with transit on the rail right of way. Thank you. And I did have um, staff comment um, to ask that we look at uh, the 7.4 workshop and um, the 8.2 to see if we can pull those in lots of them, if, if possible, um, when it's time for those to be presented. Uh, those are some recommendations that my, my staff have asked me to relay. 
Uh, so the task 7.4 to make sure that there's a workshop in Watsonville is what you're correct. Yes. Yeah, and mm -hmm. the 8.2. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are those possible, Ms. Tyker? Uh, most definitely it was planned to always include Watsonville in any of the workshops that we would be. Great. Thank you for that. Yeah. Any other uh, comments, Commissioner Mike? I just want to emphasize the importance of this business plan. Um, we're going to be spending millions of dollars, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars before we finish with this process and actually have something operating. And the public are going to almost certainly come out and tell us, oh, you know, yeah, you've got great visions and all everything else, but this can't work for this reason or that reason or something else. They might still disagree with the business plan, think it's not a good one or so forth, but to have an actual plan of how this thing is going to actually financially operate and work is kind of a critical thing if we're going to go out there and suggest we spend hundreds of millions of dollars in public funding over a long period of time. So I think it's, it's a critical part of this uh, RFP that we're putting out. Uh, for the consultants to tell us how they're going to construct that business plan and what kind of information we'll have from it. Because again, it needs to be concrete enough so that people, again, even if they disagree with it, at least see there is a plan and this is how we think this is going to actually function. So that's my only comment. Thank you for the exclamation point. Commissioner Leopold. Uh, I just want to add that I, I fully support the idea of doing meetings in Watsonville, and I especially appreciate the suggestion from city staff. I would also ask the city to play a role in helping us get people to come to the meeting because it was in our last item we talked about how it was difficult to get people to Watsonville meetings. So if, if we could get help from the city, that might be, um, we might have greater success. Any other comments? Okay, Ginger, thanks for the presentation. And I'll open up to the, pu <clears throat> the public right now. Anybody from the public like to comment on this item? State uh, CFSD, I wasn't going to comment on this, but I, I wanted to make sure that um, I agree with Commissioner Brown on casting a wider net uh, for the ad hoc committee. I uh, may resolve some issues prior to you doing these presentations uh, uh, from the public. Um, and I don't mean to rub people the wrong way here, but I hope it doesn't turn into a result like the Unified Corridor Investment Study where you had a lot of public input, which was very appreciative. In my opinion, following the Unified Corridor study, uh, the most popular scenario there was B, which was primarily mass transit, less greenhouse gas emissions and less vehicle miles traveled. And once that got back to staff, it turned into a terrible scenario. It went into cars once again and actually dropped some of the bus issues. So I hope we're not just starting that all over again. And I think by casting a wider net and having more public input and maybe even having some citizens participate with the experience, maybe in transportation on that committee, would be a very good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Sally Arnold, Friends of the Rail and Trail. Um, I just want to thank the staff and the, the RTC for directing staff and, for, and staff for going back and doing the extra work to really improve this alternatives analysis by including, I mean, excuse me, the scope of work for the alternatives analysis. Um, I think that by including the triple bottom line and by really, uh, you know, it's, it's improved, it's much improved. And the, uh, um, I think, you know, when you ask the right questions, you ask robust questions, you're going to get more quality answers at the end. And I feel like this scope of work um, is leading us in the right direction to, to ask some, uh, ask the right questions. And um, I think that um, I'm really looking forward to participating in the, in the process as this goes forward. So thanks for, I know it was a lot of extra work, it was a little bit of delay, but I think it was worth it. And thank you for doing that. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, our goal is to listen to that presentation, provide instruction, and we look forward to the request for proposals. So, um, I think we need to make a motion to approve the staff recommendation. Second. Um, 
but I'd like to add a direction that the chair can consult with the staff of the Transit District and the Commission and return with the proposed by our committee to oversee the process. Second. I agree with that. Second. Who's the second? Uh, Leopold. 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 All right. Any other comments? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries unanimously with the addition. Thank you. Okay, it takes us to uh, item 20, it's a Cruise 511 program update. Amy and Rondo, come on up here. and share some information about the exciting new initiative we're launching to modernize and improve our TDM services in the county. Um, the primary objective of our program is really is to help travelers use the existing transportation system to get to where they're going and where they want to go and to get there safely and uh, efficiently using sustainable transportation methods. We call cruise511.org as our centralized go-to place for TDM services, and all of these services are offered primarily online on our website. And they include an, intera an, in excuse me, an interactive traffic map with real-time traffic conditions on travel speeds, any incidents that are on the highway, lane closures, construction alerts, as well as carpool and manifold matching, park and ride lot information, personalized trip planning, tips for using transit, as well as referral services for accessible tra travel in the county. Uh, staff also participate in various community, uh, community events throughout the year to promote Cruise 511 and our services, including at, at uh, local festivals, business fairs, wellness fairs, environmental fairs, and so forth. Um, what we, we also work with employers and schools and other organizations to help them set up their workplace community programs. In the last year, we've had uh, we've had 1,700 participants. Well, we have 1,700 participants currently as active uh, active participants looking for carpool matching. And in the last couple of years, we've had those numbers decline. In the last uh, since um, 2019, we've only had 31 individuals sign up for carpool matching. So it shows an opportunity for us to revamp those particular services and get people on board and using. Um, using new tools, and that's one of the efforts we're, we're working on is towards modernizing, in particular, carpool and band pool matching. Um, in addition, the, the service that we use currently for ride matching is powered through the uh, Bay Area 511 program, and they're gradually phasing <coughs> out that program and that database in search of new online tools, mm -hmm. and so we're also uh, being forced to find our own, uh, our own solution for carpool and ride matching. Staff have also been working with park and ride lot coordination, and in the last uh, year and a half or so, we've had two park and ride lots that have permanently closed, um, and that's taking away 65 parking spaces that are available for carpoolers and commuters to use. Um, and staff has spent a considerable amount of time in the last couple of months trying to identify alternative locations for existing car uh, van poolers that were impacted by the closure of the SoCal park and ride lot and they were able to come up with a temporary agreement with the Capitola Mall to identify 20 spaces for existing van pullers. Um, as well, we, we also expect uh, another temporary park and ride lot closure coming up in, the, in sometime soon, we don't know the exact details yet, um, but for the park and ride lot at Resurrection Church. And if you can click on the next slide. Uh, I have on the map here, you'll see where the red X's are. Those are the lots that have been closed permanently. And then the orange T is the temporary location for where we have the, the temporary lot. Um, that lot is, is available until the end of the summer, and we're hoping that we can establish a permanent, um, a permanent agreement with the, with the property owner now. Um, the next item I want to talk about is cruise511.org. So our website has experienced year-over-year -year website traffic growth. Um, and has and it typically it has about four times the annual traffic of the RTC website. So we do get a lot of a lot of web traffic. Uh, in the last year, we've had 90,000 users 
who have come to our site looking at our information. Um, they're coming to our site particularly during the evening commute, the afternoon commute, and they're looking for information during the weekday. Um, we found that 85% of our traffic in our page views are specifically for traveler information. So we know we're, we're doing a great job at providing traveler information, providing resources and tools that people are wanting and they're needing, and they're looking for this information at the times that they want it, which is when there's an incident on the highway, when they're stuck in traffic, um, when, when there's something happening that's impacting their travel. And it gives them the opportunity to see what's happening on, in the world in real life conditions, and it gives them the opportunity to make those smarter travel decisions so that they can alter their travel path, uh, their travel plans accordingly. Uh, let's see, and one of the other items that we've found is that more than half of our users coming to cruise501.org are accessing the site on their mobile device. Um, that tells us a lot. It tells us that that's where people are looking for their information, that's where they're getting their information, and that's where we should be providing that information. So we're working with our website consultant to update our site, uh, to make continual improvements on the site, as well as uh, a mobile first uh, design, so that when people are coming from their phone, they're getting the experience that they want, they're getting the information that they need, and then that will also allow us to work on efforts to, um, to get people, once they use the traveler information, to then look at the other tools that we have, the, the other tips and the other resources for different modes. Um, so with that being said, I've talked a little bit about how our website is, is growing, traffic is growing, we have the tools, we're improving the site. And then uh, the next direction we're going is to really update the TDM services to the next level, to really modernize them and include more technology. And in January 2019, the commission received a presentation from previous Cruise 5 and 1 staff about modernizing access to shared mobility options and the commission approved a budget amendment to implement a two-year uh, pilot agreement for a, commu a commuter management online TDM tool. Um, and then in the, during that time, we uh, issued a request for proposals and eventually we entered into an agreement with Ride Amigos to implement a commute manager platform. Um, we'll, you can see on the map right here, we, when we were looking through the proposals that we received for this online tool, uh, Ride Amigos is already in, in uh, it being used with throughout the, the Central Coast as well as in Northern California and, and throughout the general area. Um, and that, that really creates a, an opportunity for us to integrate all of our ride sharing and, and getting people to get those matches whether they live in our county or they live outside of the county. So long as they're traveling within our areas, we can capture those commuters and start using these new tools. Um, you go ahead and you go next. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the features that this tool does have, it's a unified trip planning uh, tool. So it has trip planning for car pools, for uh, van pools, for existing van pools. There's a ride match, ride matching within um, mid route, so between your origin, your destination. Anyone who has a similar route within, within that particular uh, trip can also potentially be paired for, for a car pool match so that you can, you can create a, a carpool. Um, you can also do this for any major events that are happening in the county. We can set them up and we can have those, uh, have those events set up so that when people are going, they can also access tools for ride sharing to get to those particular events. Um, the other part, portion of the tool that's really exciting is the mode comparison for all travel. So in the site, uh, in the tool, you, what, you'll, what the users will typically encounter um, you can go on to the next one, please. It is, this is essentially, it's, it's a custom website that's linked to cruise511.org, and what users will do is simply enter in their destination, their home, their home address, their destination address, and then um, you can, you'll press let's go, and then you'll be presented with various options. Uh, click next, please. Um, another screenshot example right here is you put in that information, and then you can see right up front all of your different options. So you can determine if your trip is, has any carpool matches. You could then set up a, a carpool within the network and immediately connect with someone. Um, you can look at the various transit transit uh, transit service that, that are happening at that particular time for your travel. 
and you can look at the routes and then select the route that you want. There's also walk, uh, walk options, bike options, and eventually we'll get those bike layers integrated that are based <coughs> on the open map system. So they're user, they're user edited. Um, and then one of the, the other features of the site is, a, um, is, a, is an app, it's a mobile app, and this is, this is um, coming to the direction with, where we know that our users are using a mobile app. They're using their phone, and they wanna be able to, to use their phone for, for their tools. And so what this app does, it has predictive tra tracking, which you can enable location services, and their lot, and then set up your, your typical commute, and then the application can generally make an assumption based on if, if you're traveling, and then it can preload all of those trips into a custom trip planner or a trip log, and then users can, can keep track of their sustainable uh, transportation modes that they can use. Let's see, go ahead and click the next slide. Um, so when users enter their trip information, they enter their routes and they're constantly uh, putting this information into the system, us as administrators have the opportunity to really look at the impacts both for the, for the individual users as well as for the system throughout. And this is information that I think is really helpful that will be of great use to the commission to try to identify what we're doing and how we're, and how we're progressing. Um, we have the opportunity to look at the number of alternative trips that have been logged using the system. Um, the alternative miles that have been traveled using sustainable modes versus driving alone, as well as the amount of greenhouse gases that we reduce using various modes. And then for those, uh, those travelers that are using the active transportation, you also have how many calories that you burn, or potential calories that you burn, and how much money you save from driving alone to using sustainable modes. And then you go next. Um, and then one of the, the features that we really like is, um, is the, the, the modules that offer incentives, offer rewards, and offer challenges. And this is what will allow users to enter their information, but as well as to keep them coming back, to keep them involved in the program, to keep them excited about using the tools that we have, that we have available, as well as being able to have friendly competition both with their coworkers as well as other other um, groups out in, out in out in the county. Uh, go ahead, go next. Um, in addition, the the online platform. Um, so I mentioned there's there's quite a few tools that are in this platform, and one of the the other nice features about this is that it's available in Spanish using Google Translate services, so that uh, you can you can get this right in multiple languages. As well, there's a high contrast view for users who are visually impaired, so that they can still see um, all the information that's displayed on their site. And then, as well as the site is mobile responsive, meaning that it can be viewed on a tablet, on a phone, any size phone, any size monitor, and everything is still going to be looking uh, appropriate and the right size for uh, for users to view. All right. Um, so while implementing this program, we're starting it uh, essentially as a both a collaborative and a phased approach towards implementing this commute manager um, as the, as for the pilot program. We're starting with our pre-launch in September, and that really is just to get the, the bells and whistles fine-tuned <laughs> and to make sure that the, the groups that we're working with know how to use the system, are familiar with the reporting tools, can set up their challenges, their, their incentive uh, platforms, and so forth. And then, we'll, and then we'll move on to a soft launch in October. And in October, we'll then be working with our anchor groups that we've defined, so Ecology Action, uh, the City of Santa Cruz, and the University, uh, to get their employees on board, enrolled in the program, and start testing out the features. The features. One, of the one of the critical elements of any successful ride share and trip planning uh, program is that you need, you need a wide pool of potential users so that you can have the option to, to match those users and have, and have options of matching. And if a user is to come in early on and they find no matches, they typically will fall off and they won't come back. So it's one of our challenges, and that's why we're going with this approach now, to start off with some major employers who already have programs working, that essentially is you know, capturing the low-hanging fruit. And in between the soft launch and the full launch that we're doing in the spring of 2020, 
We'll be working with South County employers to try to get them on board as well, and employers in Watsonville and groups in Watsonville to get them on board, get them using the tool. And then by spring 2020 in our full launch, uh, we'll start promoting this tool to the general public. So I think with that being said, that's my, that's my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions, answer any, um, provide any clarity on the tools, and yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Any questions for Mr. Ron? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm, I'm glad this work is continuing when you look at the numbers. There are lots of people who are interacting uh, with the Cruise 511 website. Um, just two things. Uh, well, maybe more than two. The, the Go 831. Yeah. What What is that? I, I, I'm, I'm just not familiar with that. Is Sorry, I forgot to explain that. So the Go 831 is similar to the Cruise 501 program in Santa Cruz County. Go 831 is the program that the Transportation Agency in Monterey County has. Okay. So it's, it's essentially it's our sister program. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they've had the Right of Eagles tool for about a year now and they're going into their continual efforts to launch and promote their program. And they're also partnering with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership um, to really tap into their employer network and reach out and to encourage and participation. Great. And we'll be, we'll be also working with them to have our own, um, our, our own type of workshops with, um, with MBEP in Santa Cruz County to get those employers on board as well. Is there any opportunity with the Ride Amigos program to link in with the data that's going to be coming on the metro buses about when they're coming? Absolutely. Okay, so yeah. you'll be able to look and say your ride, your bus is going to show up in three minutes. Or yeah. Uh, so all of all of the, the data that's in that's in the, the the tool right now are all direct feeds coming from the different providers. So so long as Metro has that data in, in an acceptable format, um, which it, they tend to have that data currently now in a Google in a Google format that we can get that information. And so, as far as staff, we don't have to continually manually update any of the route information. <laughs> well, I think that may, I mean I, I know that's a uh, that's a big uh, new feature that the Metro is going to be offering this year, and having this on this program will be well, I think will be really great. Uh, last thing I'll say is I really want to extend my appreciation for the hard work the staff did to find alternative locations for the closure of the park and ride lot and so uh, uh, on um, the metro park and ride lot. Uh, there were van poolers who were using that lot. There were other problems with that lot, um, and that's why Metro needed to close it. But there were van poolers who would use that, uh, counted on that, and. Um, and we're really looking for something, and I know the staff worked very hard uh, to find something, and I appreciate all the work that went into that. I'm sure they did. Yeah. Ms. Cop Gomez? Yes, thank you. A um, couple things. Can you elaborate a little bit more on uh, parking cash out? Uh, and that was one of the hubs that was on the, one of the slides. Yeah, that was um, just a, a general infographic. Um, but yeah, typically parking cash outs, uh, we, we haven't worked with that in our, in our program and haven't used that, but it is an option for employers to use if they provide free parking. Um, we can, in our workplace programs, we can try to encourage them to either use parking cash out options or other options to convince their employees to um, avoid driving them off. And um, the, the other question I have is, I know that you had a CO2 evaluation of you know, the, the reduction there. Um, when people go in, do you indicate whether it's an EV or not? Because that may make a difference on what your calculations are. Right. We, we do have that option. Um, I'm not entirely sure um, as far as the CO2, uh, CO2 metrics for the EV option. Um, but that is a layer that we are adding and that is a mode that, um, that we, can, we can include as far as the, the, mode, of tra the mode of travel that, that the, the user is using. Um, can this also indicate where the EV stations are? Yeah, and, and we're working so on that, that, layer, that layer as well. Okay, good. And the, the last question that I have here is of the, of the collaborative partners, mm -hmm. um, I didn't see Cabrillo College. We haven't uh, created a partnership with them as of yet. Um, that is one of our, one of our goals is to, to get them on board, and we're trying to do that between, between now and the full lunch. Okay, great. Good to hear. Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. 
So um, I also appreciate the hard work. Sounds like you're doing um, a lot of planning. Um, but it does beg the question in terms of programs like this, when it sounds good and it looks good, but does it do good? And when you're spending the type of money that we're spending on programs like 511, it's a hard question that has to be answered because we're responsible to the taxpayers to make sure that the money is well spent. Um, I'm looking at the park and ride situation. Uh, you know, Scotts Valley Transit Center is responsible for 223. Uh, lot capacity and I think we even have an overflow for another 20 or 30 cars that we have an agreement with uh, uh, the property that we own for uh, our library that we've uh, given. Uh, we also have the Boys and Girls Club even though it isn't an official van pool sort of situation but uh, tons of Google and other uh, riders park maybe 50 or 60 cars at the Boys and Girls Club uh, and they actually make some money on that I think. So my first question is, you know, the, the Scotts Valley Transit Center, uh, there was a lot of controversy for it, um, was established in 1996. I think Mike, Mike, Mike Rockin was the chair of the uh, transit board then. Um, and to me, one of my questions is, why has it been so hard to find capacity for park and rides, I mean, over the years? Um, you know, uh, the Resurrection Church, it seems like every church in this county might be amenable towards at least some sort of agreement where we would pay them for their off hours. I mean, for the most part, unless they have severe day or uh, ample daycare capacity and are doing, uh, looking after kids and they don't have, an, <coughs> excuse me, that they don't have the ability to accept uh, people who park there for a full day during the week. Um, it just seems to me that we could at least do an outreach to every church in the county saying, hey, are you interested? Are you interested? Because this is a dearth of, of uh, you know, amount of, of uh, people who can park and ride even if they wanted to. So that's my first question. Has anybody really tried re in earnest to uh, contact churches and say, hey, can you help us out? And we're, we're willing to pay you. Yeah, we, um, I'm not sure, uh, entirely sure about the we're willing to pay you portion, um, ask, but we have looked, ar we have looked around, um, staff has, has uh, reached out to a number of different local businesses, and one of the, the primary issues or concerns tends to be with overnight parking and security, um, and, and both security during the day for people who are parking, as well as overnight security for bankable parking at these particular locations. And that was one of the reasons why the Quaker Meeting House uh, lot was closed, was due to security concerns, overnight parking. Um, I'm not sure if there was either crime that was happening there overnight, um, but they couldn't afford to hire security, an overnight security. And I don't think that was something that either we had the funds to do, or I'm not sure, Louise, I think you can probably speak a bit more about it. Yeah, certainly. Uh, it is a constant effort to uh, try to uh, both keep the uh, park and ride lots green effect uh, operating and then get additional uh, park and ride lots. I mean, Amy did mention some of the concerns that, uh, that have come up. Um, and yes, we do work with uh, all the various uh, potential park and ride lot uh, partners. And we do uh, offer to, to pay uh, for, you know, improvements that may be needed at the, at the lot and so on, or we, we maintenance, repaving and so on. And yes, even the possibility of doing some sort of a rental um, or lease and something like that, that, that is also always a possibility and we provide all the insurance that might be necessary, etc. Uh, but even with all that, I mean, that there, are, there are concerns um, uh, that, that come up and, and like Amy said, the, 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 uh, some Crime has, has occurred, parking ride lots, and so the and security has been uh, much more, uh, it's, it's, it's been a significantly greater need uh, for security, and, I, and a lot of places have, have decided they need to basically close up their lots at a certain point in time 
uh, which then makes it difficult for park and lot users if they're closing too early or, uh, or the, you get van pool um, um, arrangements where they do require to have you know, overnight parking for their, for their van uh, for out their meeting location, so it does not it does make it difficult. But we do continue to work constantly, and, and, and part of what worked great with the Capitol Mall is that they already have security there uh, you know, 24 hours a day and so on, and that, and that really helps. So that's been a good uh, partnership with them. Like uh, Amy said, it's temporary for now, um, but they've been very cooperative, and it, it looks like uh, we will have a you know permanent agreement with them. So that's very good, and we continue to look for other potential places. Um, you know, we've reached out to a number of churches, to uh, uh, commercial establishments, and so on. Uh, you know, with commercial establishments, part of, what, part of what we do is say, well, look, look we're going to bring more people to your commercial area. Because you know, so that, that might benefit you. Because once they're here, they might be you know shopping at your, at your locations here, and that's attractive uh, to them. But still, even with that, it, it, it has been a challenge. Yeah. So, so what you're saying though is that even though our intentions are good, the outcome has not been so good. It's it, is, it certainly has been a challenge. I, I, I mean, we've had, uh, you know, we still have work and red lots, and so that's that's really good. And we continue to work to have you know have additional lots. So in the past uh, 10 years or so, Commute Solutions, I think we use that in terms of our, um, uh, when we do our budget, there's a line there for two full-time employees for Commute Solutions, roughly paying somewhere in the neighborhood of $220,000 a year for employees. It, uh, it's not two full-time employees. Uh, it has been maybe one to one and a quarter time or something like that. And it, and it varies depending on, on what what is the work that's being done uh, each year. Like for example, um, like Amy um, uh, mentioned the closure of the parking ride lots. That that uh, took a lot a lot of work uh, on sta uh, uh, from staff and you don't have that all the time. Uh, so depending on what's happening that requires a lot more staff work and there might be more staff work in a particular year than there is in another. Is that the budget line that covers the 511, or, or is it in addition to that? Yeah, Cruise 511 and, and it is the overall umbrella for the you know, motorist uh, uh, information and TDM programs. That's everything. Well, I know, but are they commingled in terms of budget? Uh, in other words, do Community Solutions budget line and also 511 budget uh, commingle and you get a, a new budget? Uh, it's it's all the same. It's all, Part same program. Okay. Um, so you've also mentioned, I think, on twenty point uh, dash four about um, the ride sharing, local transit, uh, bike pooling, walk and bike options, the planner, and when you say um, commute manager online platform, that's a that's what you're talking about here. It's a it's a program that you we purchase. Correct. Okay. For sixty-five thousand plus twenty or forty thousand from Santa Cruz. Correct. Sixty-five thousand for the two-year the two-year agreement. It's uh, thirty thirty thousand thirty-five thousand the first year to implement the program to get it all set up, and then um, the thirty thousand or the remaining for uh, the the second year, and that's specifically for maintenance. Like I said, I I appreciate the uh, report. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm a little dubious about whether or not this is going to have a true effect on community in in our area. I mean, all I have to do is just kind of uh, look at the again the good intentions of, of trying to have quote commute solutions, and then uh, just go at 2:30 on Highway One to see what the effect is. But uh, I uh, I am open to be uh, surprised. So thank you. Commissioner sure Petrano. Uh, thank you for your report too, and in the vein of trying to improve the uh, options that you have. Um, as things uh, unfold in Capitola, I'd like to know more about it. Um, I do know of a couple of locations that might be useful for the program after the mall is no longer a location. Um, thank you very much for your efforts. In a sense, this does provide, in terms of the alternate analysis, an alternate. And as much as it um, offers to the community, the more it's uh, accepted, uh, it's definitely more of an alternative. Thank you. Commissioner Wagner. So I want to start by apologizing for not coming to meet with staff before the meeting to ask some of these questions. But um, I'm on page 20-5. 
Do I understand correctly that the cost of this program this this year is roughly 190,000 plus the uh, 65,000 we added for the community manager program? Is that the, the budget cost for this item? That is correct. Yes. And I also understand from the report here that we have about a little under 2,000 people that are using the ride share function, and about 90,000 people that are using the um, uh, information aspects of this program. Can you give me a? I know you can't give me exactly because it was Randy made clear that it's kind of commingling of the program. But what's the relative share of how much money goes to the funding ends up through staff time or materials or whatever else? Into the ride, into the um, you know the ride sharing program versus the information aspect of the program, like a 50-50 or 90-10, or I have no idea. It's a great question. I, I I don't think I could tell you that, and I don't know. Um, I mean, because we we do a lot of um, Amy said a lot of outreach in various different ways, and the outreach is for the overall uh, program, which includes, includes everything. Uh, so I. I, I don't know, and it'd be and it'd be hard, I think, to separate, um, you know, exactly what would go to one and what would go to the other. So uh, the question is inspired by Randy's earlier questions in the earlier, earlier meeting in May, I think it was, or June. Um, and I'm not uh, a proponent of the program at all. I think it has great potential, but I'm, I'm just trying to do, you know, really, really rough numbers here, looking at the the cost divided by the people that benefit from it, and asking, you know, would they be better served by having two bus routes, which you could buy for the same amount of money? Um, and in order, order to try and understand that, I, you know, you need to know whether, like, you know, if most of the money is going into the ride share part of the program, then it's like, you know, two hundred dollars a person that benefits from it. If it's most of the work's going into keeping the information on the internet and people having access to find out which roads are busy and all the other kinds of stuff that a lot you know important information we do, then you get a much better bang for the buck in terms of like what the costs are. So I'd like to get some information back at some point. Um, I mean, I'm not looking for an exact dollar figure. I'm not going to cut the program in half or something. I just want to understand what the benefit is. I think people have a right to understand, you know, like what are we getting out of this program in terms of the, who's being served or how many people are being served. So I, I, you know, an order of magnitude would be fine with me. But I'd like to get that information back. I think it'd be very helpful. And I, I try to go through the budget to figure it out, but I'm not capable of it. Somebody has to explain it to me as a like, person member of the board. So one thing I can share is that typically with the traveler information, a lot of that information is coming from our specific fees. So that, that data that's coming in is automated. Um, and the information that we put on the website for the most part, it's automated, except for the alerts that come in. We'll put that. We'll put that data on that site. Um, we pay for website hosting, for um, for IT consultant, for you know, sure, for, for any fixes like that. So there's there's those fixes, and they're pretty small. And the site tends to to, to work itself. Um, what we find is that we're for rideshare in particular, we're spending more of our staff time, our staff time directly interacting with individuals, directly interacting with. Uh, with employers, and we found, and so what we're trying in the, in the past, we've we've done those same activities, we've worked with them. We get to a point where we said, you have all the tools that you need, you're good to go, go on your way, and then it falls off. And now we've spent three months with this particular employer or this group, and then we have nothing to show. We have no no impact, um, but we've had plenty of staff time. Um, so what we're trying to do is use these new tools to say, well, these are the resources that you have available. This is what you can do, and let's educate you so that you could use these tools on your own so staff can work with some of our, um, our, our other communities and, and really have boots on the ground and, and doing this information and doing this um, outreach and using the tools that we've learned from our previous pilot program, which is there are, there are individuals who a lot can do everything on their own with the website, and then there are the others who need that specific handholding. And that's where our staff time is really going, is, is getting the, getting those people involved. So uh, as the program, the new aspects of the program unfolded, I think it'd be helpful for us to get some idea of get how the sort of time is being split and the, mm -hmm. the work. Because it, it's not a trivial amount of time to set up you know, communication systems and information as well to keep them updated and accessible. Mm -hmm. We want that to be completely accurate. If it's not, it's totally useless. Right. You know, in fact, it tells you the road's busy and it's not because your stuff's you know, out of date or whatever right. is an issue. So I, I think it'd be helpful in sort of trying to capture some of those metrics as you're developing this 
program over the next several months. So, we'll see. Thanks. Commissioner Johnson. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, in a prior life, um, with the College of Action, we have a great deal of experience with TDM programs. Of course, that's where Back to Work is. And one of the things that we learned doing some of the more manual outreach programs, as you described, is that um, they're sort of like recycling programs. You can go into a school and set them up, but then if you don't go back every year, year after year, and get a champion on that site, they sort of go away. And a lot of assumptions about people just maintaining a, a, a TDM or a recycling program, like, oh, that's a no-brainer if you're an environmentalist, it, it's just, it's not, it doesn't work that way. I think this is a really good direction, and this is getting more automated, and you're empowering local employers. And for the amount of money we're spending, I think it's a really big, big bang for the buck. It doesn't seem to maybe be as apparent for some people in this room right now for that. But I think once you have more automated um, usage, you've empowered those employers, and you've got this, that data coming back to you, um, I think you're, I think the result's going to be it's, it, it's very um, very effective for the money we spend compared to other things. Um, but I did have one question about that was the comment. But you said there was a question about you recruiting Cabrillo mm -hmm. as an employer. I would hope you also would do the same with the county, yes, which absolutely. already provides free bus passes and electric charging stations and for their employers employees. Great, absolutely. thank you for your work. Commissioner Muller. Uh, thank you very much. We. Um, we had initially considered this um, idea to improve our, our TDM platform. Um, I'd ask that, that our, our proposal include um, mobility as a service integration that would allow for um, a user to plan and pay for a trip um, across multiple platforms. So I'm glad to see that the bus information could be integrated in there. but. I had also hoped that it would integrate platforms like Jump, Uber, and Lyft into the platform. Is, is that still an option? Yes, we'll, we'll have bike share. So the Jump uh, jump layer will be added. Um, you will be able to see where the, where the bike stations are located and the available the number of available bikes in that area. Uh, we, we, we specifically focus on not having in-app payments so that our program is not responsible for any, any transaction. Um, and so all of those referrals will then be referred to those specific sites where the, the users can sign up and, and create their, their registration. Great. Um, I, I also, I, maybe I misread the map, but it looks like the, the Right Amigo doesn't operate in Santa Clara County? Yes. Uh, so the 511 program throughout, throughout the Bay Area is, is, uh, is operated by their own consultant and they have uh, their database that they've been using throughout those counties. Um, just, I believe it was on Monday, uh, MTC issued an RFP for a, a very similar service, that they're, they're phasing out their ride share program and they're, car and they're looking for an online platform that's a, a comprehensive tool that has the gamification, that has the challenges, and the ability to create networks for various levels of, of programs throughout the county, a region-wide program, as well as uh, private networks for specific employers. Okay, so so there, there there might be an opportunity for our commuters who commute to Silicon Valley to participate. Yes, and um, we are, are definitely advocating for that, and we hope that we could have our entire our entire system connected so that users who are living in Santa Cruz County and commute over the hill can find those options as well. That, that seems like a, a pretty pretty glaring omission. If, if I may, if I may add to that, I believe Amy that, that there already are employers in those in those counties uh, that actually use Right Amigos. It may not be the entire county as a whole, but there are you know, significant employers already in San Clara County, in the Peninsula, and other parts of the San Francisco Bay area that use Right Amigos and are part of the Right Amigos system. Would it be helpful for us to write a letter um, encouraging them to use the service uh, to the Bay Area? Well, the Santa Clara County. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe that uh, might be a uh, direction at the end of this is uh, direct the chair to write a letter, encourage them to participate with all the other counties. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, with 90,000 visits, uh, what are we doing to highest and best utilization to let them know about what RTC is doing? Do we have a link that they can link through? Do we, 
let's let's use the resource of all of those people visiting this. If it's a transportation hub, let's make sure that we have the RTC part of it. How will that look in terms of? Is it just going to be a link through? Are we going to be able to do that? Um, what information could we make available that way? I'm not sure I quite understand your question. So from Cruise 511, or from the new tool uh, to yeah. RTC? Well, it, if the if the tool is providing ninety thousand visits, mm -hmm. and that's more than what our RTC site right. is doing, how do we utilize that to get them to see what's going on with the RTC? Mm -hmm. Well, so in our on our homepage we have we have a news uh, a news section on there. So any any developments that are coming out of Cruise Five or out of RTC that are that are somewhat related, uh, we'll post on there, and then we also have the Cruise Five One One. Um, sidebar module that's directly on the RTC homepage. And you bring up a good point to actually to essentially reverse that so that we also have that information just automatically coming in on the Cruise 501 site. So. Yes, there's so much PR that goes out there. Once they've got your, your name, it's, um, you know, we're getting the, the email, the, the text message kind of reminder um, that goes out. And just the, the way the marketing tools work with a lot of these businesses, once they've got it, that you're, you're hooked on getting at least a little bit occasionally. And I'm, I'm sure that by doing 90,000 visits, we, we have quite a few um, resources to get a hold of those people for other things as well. And to utilize it just beyond the, line, the 511 op option of maybe some RTC reminders that we're able to use that, that channel that's been opened up for those users. Absolutely. Yeah, well, one of the, the features that we're looking at um, is uh, just providing both the, the, the news articles that we have on there, the traffic alerts that come on the page. So you really are referencing a lot of the content that's coming from Caltrans about, about alerts, also alerts that are coming from the county. Um, and then we have our Twitter feed that also has alerts that we're sharing, that we're sharing in real time, that also are coming from people out in the community providing that information. Thank you. Any other commissioner questions? I'm going to open up to the public. Anybody from the public like to speak on uh, Cruise 511? Everybody's happy with the system. Okay, we'll bring it back for some action by the board. Is there any uh, action the board like to take? I would, I would, well, I'd like to make a motion that we direct our chair to contact uh, Santa Clara County Transportation uh, Authority. MTC? MTC manages the, the, the whole. Uh, well, they'll work with staff for the appropriate person to encourage the use of Ride Amigos um, to support our commuters uh, who are traveling over the hill. Great. I, uh, I, there is, it is just an information item, but I think it's great idea that we do encourage that county to participate. Second. <laughs> motion, and, motion by uh, Leopold, second by uh, Schifflin. And, and, I, and I just want to comment on this. I think this is, a, I think I appreciate the presentation. I think we brought this up probably five or six months ago. And there was concern about how the RTC is spending its funds. And I think at the end of this conversation, what we really needed was to be enlightened. And I feel like it uh, wasn't a, a pessimistic approach. It was a little bit more optimistic. So um, it's about a little over $200,000 that we spend. And some of that has got, is received back to other grants and other things. So at this time, and the potential of this program, as was mentioned by many commissioners, is, is a great potential. I think we just need to ride this out for a while and see how it goes. So with that, we have a motion for a letter. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And we'll see that that letter gets out to, to the county. Thank you. Thank Very you. Much. Okay, our next item is a uh, legal services contract. And uh, Mr. Mendez. Yes, uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, as you know, the Regional Transportation Commission has been using the Office of the Santa Cruz County Council for as its legal counsel. As the RTC became a fully autonomous agency, purchased the Santa Cruz Ranch Rail Line, began implementing construction projects, and became the authority for the Transportation Sales Tax Measure, Measure D, the legal services required by the RTC have increased significantly. In addition, as the RTC is now a property owner, Legal matters can and have arisen where the RTC and the County of Santa Cruz have adverse interests, making it difficult for the County Council's office to represent both parties simultaneously. And Santa, uh, Santa the Cruz County uh, Council's office has provided tremendous uh, service to the uh, to the RTC over, over its entire existence. Um, 
but based on these challenges that, that have come up, the County Council uh, did recommend that the RTC hire a full service legal firm to provide all or most of its legal services. And a full service legal firm can provide the required general legal counsel services uh, that a public agency needs, while also providing specialized uh, legal services such as environmental law, labor law, real property law, and transportation law. So with the assistance of the County Council's office, the, uh, the RTC did release a request for proposals. Uh, and there was an evaluation uh, and selection committee that was composed of your chair, uh, Ed uh, Bottor, uh, Commissioner Ryan Coonerty, Chief Assistant County Counsel Jason Heath, uh, your RTC uh, Executive Director, at Preston, and our Deputy Director, Luis Mendez. Uh, five well-qualified legal firms submitted proposals and the interview uh, team decided to uh, interview the top two firms. Uh, and so after completing the interviews, the reference checks, the evaluation and selection committee recommends hiring the firm Myers, Nave, Ryback, Silver, and Wilson. Uh, attachment two is an excerpt from their proposal that uh, shows the proposed legal team and provides a summary of their qualifications. Uh, now, Myers and I proposed Steve Mattis as the general counsel for RTC. Mr. Mattis is here today, so he can uh, introduce to himself when I'm done uh, with my report. And you're free to ask him questions if you like as well. He currently serves as general counsel for the Ventura County Transportation Commission. And the Ventura County Transportation Commission has similarities to the RTC in that it's a, a coastal uh, county community. Uh, it also uh, has uh, a couple of rail lines that it's uh, purchased, uh, one that uh, has um, service on it, freight service and excursion service. They're also working to have a, uh, a bicycle pedestrian facility on, on the rail lines. So that offers a great similarity to what we have here in, uh, in San Cruz County. And they're also, of course, a transportation planning agency like we are. Uh, they are not a sales tax authority, but Myers County does represent other agencies that are. Uh, sales tax authority, so they do have that expertise and experience. And although the hourly rates charged by Myers and Navi attorneys are greater than the hourly rate charged by the County Council's office, uh, most of the RC's legal services currently are uh, provided by outside firms that charge similar rates to what Myers and Navi uh, charges. And so in evaluating the Myers and Navi rate, staff has determined that the proposed rates are fair and equitable for the quality of services that are to be provided, and staff also believes that having a relationship with a full service legal firm will create a certain economy of usage. Uh, and as the relationship with its general counsel uh, will be managed concurrently with the usage of any, any specialized legal services. Um, there is uh, sufficient um, budget in the approved RTC budget uh, for the contract as proposed. Uh, the, the contract that we proposed is for $900,000 over a three-year period, so we estimate that it would be about three hundred thousand dollars a year. And in actuality, how much the RTC pays in legal service from year to year can depend significantly, uh, based on, on what's happening, whether the RTC uh, gets sued over one thing or another, and so on. But uh, with the, the various additional duties that the RTC has been taking on over the past few years, there is greater likelihood of, of uh, you know, having to you know, have much more legal work done by the RTC, including responding uh, to lawsuits and defending the RTC in lawsuits. So as a result, uh, or the Evaluation Selection Committee uh, does recommend that the RTC approve the attached resolution, attached one authorizing the Executive Director to execute a legal services contract with the firm of Myers, Nave, Ryback, Silver, and Wilson for comprehensive legal services for an amount not to exceed $900,000 for a three-year term. Um, and the uh, draft contract and, and scope are included here, uh, attached with your staff report, so that you've got a chance to, uh, to take a look at it. And uh, at this point, uh, uh, Mr. Mattis, if you would mind introducing yourself, that, that would be great. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Mattis, before I bring it up, I'm just going to make a quick comment. I'm, I'm going to give you the floor, but I just want to throw a little disclaimer in here. Uh, it was my privilege to serve on this uh, committee with uh, the other members that Mr. Mendez mentioned, and the uh, quality of the candidates was, uh, was excellent. Uh, but make no doubt that the, the, the firm that we selected was far superior from the others that we interviewed. Uh, so I happily am making this recommendation that we assign this contract. I think the point that uh, Mr. Mendez makes is, is that uh, we all know we had a great relationship with the county. Uh, and I think what happened was we lost, uh, they lost one of their providers, which was intimately tied to our, our, our decisions. 
and basically, I think uh, our demands outgrew their needs to uh, to provide the services. So that caused us to reach out to this for this uh, our own attorney. And as Mr. Mendez mentioned, the cost that we incurred, in addition to having a base contract with the county with other agencies, uh, exceeded you know would be a normal sum of what we what we expended. And our our our, our happiness with this firm is that we feel we felt in the board that. Uh, Myers now they would be able to provide and cover all the services that we have been exposed to under one roof. So uh, a lot of enthusiasm was to make this decision. So with that, Mr. Mattis, please come up and uh, introduce yourself, and then if any questions of the board, we'll uh, we'll give them a little shot at you. Okay. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Steve Mattis. I'm a principal at Myers Nave. Um, our team that we're proposing to work with the RTC includes um, four other attorneys. Eric Kasher would be the primary, uh, one of the primary assistants. Eric's background is in public contracting, in particular uh, federal and state procurement issues. Um, Lindsay DeAndre is a longtime uh, transportation area attorney and uh, would be working with us on uh, uh, contracting issues as well as rail line issues. Things has worked very closely with me on the um, rail line issues at BCTC that we've been dealing with since we took over there. Um, Claire Lai is another attorney that would work with us. Uh, Claire is a um, uh, has her focus really on again contracting issues, basic transportation issues. But Claire has also developed a, a high level of expertise in personally identifiable information issues which become very common with um, transportation agencies as they start to use uh, technologies like fast track, dynamic pricing, um, any kind of fare mechanisms, um, and any kinds of, uh, of uh, technologies that allow you to uh, you know, purchase clipper cards or various uh, payment methodologies like that. That's a very significant issue for um, any agency that does that now. Uh, Jesse Ladd is also a member of our team. Jesse is a labor and employment attorney and a labor negotiator as well, too. And then I would serve as a general counsel, um, as indicated by Mr. Mendez. Um, I have served as a general counsel at BCTC for a number of years. I'm also the, essentially the general counsel for the toll lanes um, for Alameda County Transportation Commission. And then I'm also the general counsel for the Tri-Valley Transportation Council, which is actually a, a joint powers entity that administers a regional transportation impact fee, so development impact fee. Um, and so we bring that experience to the table. Um, I, I am mindful of the comments about the, the cost and the hourly rates. I have managed as a general counsel budgets um, for public agencies during my entire career. I do understand the necessity of staying within budget. Um, we're, we're part of the team, and the team has to understand the financial uh, constraints of an agency. And so, um, so that's a point that I discussed with Mr. Preston when we were um, when we were talking through the terms of the contract. Um, we welcome the opportunity to work with with the RTC, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the, the commissioners may have. Commissioner Johnson, I have a question. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I, I didn't see where your offices are located. Um, so I'm I'm based out of Oakland. I actually live on the peninsula. Uh -huh. um, and then we have offices in Oakland, Los Angeles, San Diego, and Sacramento. Okay. Um, is it my understanding then this will obviate the need for us to have any sort of uh, resource from the county council? Yes, that's the intention. Sorry, Jason Heath with the county council's office. Yes, that's the intention, but there's going to be a transition period here where we're going to be slowing down our work while they're picking up their work and we're going to work cooperatively with Myers uh, and Ave. And our office is always going to be here in the background in case there's conflicts or there's problems. Um, folks can always pick up the phone and call us. All right. But the, but, but the intention, though, is for the relationship to be severed. Thanks. And so if I, if I read some of the scope of work then, the legal services that you provide, Mr. Mattis, it includes collective bargaining, labor matters, um, hearings and meetings, uh, public bids, and so forth. That's, so it's a whole um, uh, spectrum, really, of, of what uh, uh, an attorney and uh, a law office will do. Yes, 
Um, that's correct. Our, our, our firm primarily represents public agencies uh, throughout California. And, and we do that in many instances as the general counsel. So we do the full spectrum of services. Um, uh, Mr. Ladd and I have just recently completed labor negotiations for a city in the Bay Area. And so, so these, um, our, our attorneys have expertise in all areas. Um, that affect transportation agencies. We have a we have a, a real estate team. We have an eminent domain team. We have a labor and employment team. We have a public contracts team. Um, we have a, a conflicts team dealing with ethical issues. And so, um, what we found with all of the public agencies that we work with is that really, with the exception of workers' compensation, which we don't do, and 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 generally we don't do tort defense because practically most agencies get tort defense through a, a shared risk agency and at, generally at lower rates. Um, and so beyond those two, we, we are able to practice in all other areas. And the 300,000 really is a limit, and it's not necessarily what you will charge per year, but it's just on an hourly basis and a meeting, per meeting basis that you will charge. Uh, that's, that's correct. There would be a fixed fee on the, the, the per meeting basis for these meetings, for the commission meetings, okay. and everything else would be on an hourly rate, and then we would monitor the costs um, as would the RTC so that we can uh, essentially make sure that we stay within the budget. Um, there are instances, um, as, as uh, Mr. Mendez indicated, uh, you know, if an agency has a, a, an unusual amount of litigation or something like that, then sometimes costs will go up. But on the flip side, the costs can go down. My, my, my average costs at BCTC have, have um, uh, fluctuated over the years when there's been more litigation, the costs have been higher, but in years when there's been less litigation, the costs have been substantially less than what uh, uh, even the 300,000 that we're talking about here. All right, well, thank you. Any other questions? Commissioner Leopold. Well, I, I think it's been 20 years since the RTC started the process of um, moving out of the county building, setting up its own agency, and this is another step in that long uh, divorce of, uh, of, of uh, hiring our own um, uh, legal uh, staff and the, you seem very well uh, uh, prepared to be able to meet the needs. I think that with the support that we've gotten from the voters um, and the kind of work that we're going to get into, it seems like a very good time for us to make this move. And I've appreciated this support as I always do from our county council uh, and I look forward to working with, with you. And I think there's only one last thing that we have with the county after this, which is the payroll system. And then, or not even the payroll system, the fiscal system. Uh, that's, that's the last part of the, uh, of the partnership. But uh, welcome. Uh, I look forward to working with you. Any other questions? Ms. Coffin Gomez. Um, actually, it, based on those comments, I feel the same way. When I first came as a commissioner, it was, why don't we have our own legal counsel? And I'm pleased to see that we've got a very robust um, firm that can handle quite a few of the broad scope items that we would anticipate needing the specialized attorneys for. So thank you for moving forward with this and uh, the group that decided on which uh, council to go with. So I'm looking forward to making sure that we have that right expertise um, invested in our projects. So again, thank you. Other comments? Commissioner Rodkin. I just want to say that the uh, resumes were extremely impressive, and uh, to read through these, and I think we made a wise choice here because it was hard not to be impressed when you read through your colleagues and your own background and what you'll be bringing to this work. Thank you. Thank you. We, um, I, I will share with the commission that um, we have a team that is also just personally and professionally very interested in transportation issues, and so uh, we, we, um, you know, we enjoy the work that we're doing. Great. Any other comments? All right. Thank you, Mr. Mattis. Anybody from the public want to comment, uh, question? Seeing none, I'll bring it back uh, for recommendation. Move to approval the recommended action. Second. second. Okay. I got a motion by Leopold and a second by uh, Schifrin. And uh, all in favor? Move on. Oh. Any other comments? Yes. Okay. I want to see if anybody from the public had anything to say. But um, Commissioner Kennedy was also very impressed with this firm. He sat on the committee. Did the interviews and would agree with the comments of the chair about uh, feeling enthusiastic about the firm that's been selected. 
Thank you for adding that. Sure. I, I, I did want to want to add um, on behalf of my office and my boss, Dana McRae, uh, a very special thanks to the commission. We've enjoyed a really warm relationship with the commission over the years. I think we've done really good work together. I'm I'm sorry that Brooke Miller, who is usually sitting in this chair and is your longer time attorney, uh, was not able to be here for this last meeting. But again, thank you very much to the commission and the staff uh, for good work over the years. Thank you, Jason. I've been using Commissioner Leopold's words. This was an amicable divorce, so uh, we're, we're all looking forward to this. So with that, we'll go ahead and call the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Welcome to Santa Cruz County. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, that, uh, that. that brings us to the end of the agenda. Um, let's see what I want to announce here. We uh, do not have any closed session. So our next meeting will be Thursday, September 5th at 9 o'clock at the County Board of Supervisors. And a TPW meeting is uh, tentatively scheduled for August 15th. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you.